Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Yorana. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to be back on campus. It's, uh, it'll be fun to spend a few minutes with you. I, I want this not just to be kind of a, an opportunity to pontificate, but I'm hoping it's actually practical for you. And I, I think the, the practicality of it will increase if you'll do one thing right now. So uh, two times, these will be low risk, low stress activities. But two times I'm going to give you a chance to try something and you're going to need a buddy to do it. So find the second most attractive person on your row <laughs> and, uh, and buddy up with them. So slide over if you need to, but get, a, get into a twosome if you could. And we'll have a little bit of fun. Pairing off at BYU should not be hard. Come on. All right. Everybody got a buddy? At least those that want one. All right, good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a punchline. I, I want to tell you where, where I want to take this. So uh, you all are immersed in, uh, in a vast amount of accumulation of technical knowledge. And I'm sure you've heard the argument made many, many times that it's important to, uh, to complement that with uh, leadership, interpersonal, and some other sorts of development. What I want to tell you after 30 years in my field, the vast majority of people that we've worked with uh, have been people with strong technical backgrounds, whether CEOs or project leaders or people up and down the chain of an organization. The vast majority of people that we work with that struggle to get things done in their organizations have come to the conclusion that the limiting factor is not technical competence. The limiting factor is people's capacity to work through a human system. That that one ability is what makes or breaks people in their technical achievements as well. So it's not being able to come up with an isolated idea, it's being able to leverage a team or leverage funders or leverage an organization as you build it. So here's the punchline. The fundamental leadership lesson that I'd like to share with you today is this, the magnitude of your influence in your life, the years ahead, the health of the organizations that you're a part of or lead, the strength of your relationships in your personal and professional life, and the quality of your own life are fundamentally determined by your capacity to talk about emotionally and politically risky things. That's the punchline. Your ability to talk about politically and emotionally difficult subjects will drive every single one of those attainments. So if influence and if quality of life and if strength of relationships and healthy organizations seem like something that you might be interested in in your future, uh, this might be of use to you. Now, I, I, I was trying to think of a metaphor for what I want to share, and it struck me. I had my 50, 53rd birthday on, uh, on Tuesday, thank you very much, and, uh, and that, that causes some amount of reflection. I was looking back over my life. One of the statistics that reflects my life, if I were to be sort of a life measurement person, is that I've traveled over 5 million air miles. Uh, there are pilots in their careers that don't fly as much as, I've, uh, as I have. Uh, you, you calculate, some of you will do this really quickly, how many times I've circumnavigated the globe if you just laid that sort of end to end. So five million miles. I've stayed literally thousands of nights in hotels. And yet it was only in about the last six months that I finally discovered something that profoundly changed the quality of my life in my travel. And it, and it has to do with this picture here. So one of the little irritants that I've just kind of worked around through my entire life of traveling and staying in all of these hotels all around the world has been shower time. So, so in many hotel showers, you've probably experienced this, there's a curtain. So some of them have glass doors and things like that, but a lot of them will have a curtain. And as I get into the shower, step over the tub and, and, and start to prepare to, to bathe, one of the tasks I've always engaged in is pulling the shower curtain and moistening it so that I can stick it up against the walls. Anyone know why I have to do that? Yeah, it just sprays out all over the floor. And, and if the toilet paper is on that trajectory, then you got this soggy wad the next time you need to eat. I mean, there's all sorts of practical <laughs> problems that come out. You didn't think you'd learn this today, did you? So, so this is one of the, the habits I'd acquired. And, and about six months ago, I was showering happily, and I'd stuck it up against there. Every once in a while, it goes and kind of comes off of it, and you have to stick it back on again. I was sitting there, and I was thinking, you know, I'm probably not the only person who struggled with this. I wonder why nobody has come up with a solution. And then I started thinking, you know, what would you do to solve this problem? And, and then I thought, wait a minute. And I, and I felt up 
by the collar where the, the shower curtain is, is posted up against the wall that, that retains it there. And I discovered something that I had never known was there. Can you see it? For 30 years. This has been there, this little nub. And it turns out all you have to do, but I never knew this. All you have to do is just go like that. You just pop that little sucker over the top of that nub. And it stays up against, and I have been so happy for the last six months. <laughs> I have enjoyed my travel like never before. And as I, as I mused on how long it took me to find that, I realized a lot of what I, I do is share with people the equivalent of that little nub, sort of life nubs, just, just little tiny things that make an enormous difference in the quality of your influence, the strength of relationships, and so forth. Uh, Tuesday was not just my 53rd birthday, it was also our 23rd anniversary, so these are my partners. Uh, we've worked together for 23 years, and the most common question I get asked when I encounter people that have known us for a, a lot of that time is, are you guys still together? You know, you, you guys, you know, all, all you guys still together? And, and when I say, yeah, you know, 23 years, they, there, there's always this marveling, like, you know, what relationship lasts that long? I mean, it'd be nice to have a marriage last 23 years, but, but a professional relationship, good heavens, you know. How do you get along that long? And, and what I want to do now is reinforce the punchline. The, the reason I love these men as much as I did 23 years ago, more than I did, is because over the course of 23 years, we've had a, an incredible number of what we came to call crucial conversations. And those are the pivot points. Those are the points that either strengthen or, or damage your relationship. You, you have only two options when it comes to those moments. And we'll talk about those in a second. But now I want you to play. So if you've got a buddy, you've got somebody that you're going to work with, you need to make a quick decision. So with your buddy, decide who's person A and who's person B. Pick an A and a B. This is the easy part. Should take under 10 minutes. All right, we got an A and a B. So person A, raise your hand. Theoretically, this should be what percentage of the room? <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so about half the room. That, 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 that look good. Okay, so uh, person A, uh, your name is Nurse Bonnie. You're the woman in the, in the picture on the left here. Okay, person B, raise your hand. Person B, okay, your name is Dr. Scott. You're the guy on the right there. So here's what's going to happen. Okay, those of you who are Nurse Bonnie, raise your hand. Nurse Bonnie. Okay, those of you who are Nurse Bonnie, uh, as soon as this video stops, so you're going to watch this scene play out. These are your avatars for just a moment. You're going to watch this scene play out. As soon as it stops, I don't want you to rehearse. I don't want you to prepare. I don't want you to pause. I want you to go back into your body. Your avatar disappears, and I want you to turn to Dr. Scott and say the next thing you would say if you were her in these circumstances. Okay? Here you go. Can I get you to check in on Mr. Gonzalez before you take off? He's the older gentleman who had the punctured lung. We're hoping to release him. I can't. I got to get to my son's music assembly. Just, uh, I don't know, just tell him something came up and I'll come back tonight and check on him. Actually, his family's all here expecting to take him home. I told him you were just down the hall. Please, it'll only take a minute. You told him what? I assumed it would be okay. I thought you'd be right in. Oh, you thought? And where did you learn to think? Certainly not some two year rinky dink nursing school, that's for sure. Okay, good. So hopefully you took a shot at that. I want you to be in kind of the emotional circumstances because this is an intellectual. I mean, this, this isn't a rational sort of process. This is something that leaps upon you, that in your professional career, you're going to have somebody who you find out was talking smack about your design behind your back, and you're going to be all hot and bothered about it. And the question is going to be, how are you going to deal with that moment? Or you're going to have somebody who's not getting their deliverables to you. And it's going to be incredibly frustrating. It's going to set you up to fail. This is going to happen. And the question is, can you Imagine now what those emotional circumstances will be like and can you prepare yourself to deal with them? Now, now this was important to us because I'm going to take you out of your domain. We've done a lot of research in healthcare, And we've wondered why it is that we predictably kill about 200,000 people in hospitals in the United States every year. I mean, this may be shocking for you to hear, but the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, the sixth leading cause of death is health care. I want you to think about that, that sentence for a moment and unpack it, because it means what it sounds like it means. Medical mistakes cost about that much every year in lives and billions and billions of dollars in, in many other sorts of related effects. And we wondered how that happens. 
And so we try to look at human systems to say, why do all of these really smart people behave in predictably stupid ways? You know, why does that happen? And are there some moments of what we call disproportionate influence? Moments where somebody makes a choice that sets a chain of events in motion that makes it almost inevitable that will kill a patient, infect a patient, you know, give a medication error or something to that effect. And what we found is these are the moments. So let me ask you for a second, how many of you think that how this scenario plays out could affect, let's say, nursing turnover in this hospital? Do you think that could affect it? A little bit, yeah. And so it turns out that, that nurses quit at a remarkably high rate, and the frustrating moments tend to be moments where they feel belittled or demeaned or attacked or marginalized. And the problem is not that that moment occurs. Listen carefully. The problem is not that that moment occurs. The problem is that she won't deal with that moment, that she won't speak up, that she won't hold boundaries, that she won't express her concerns, she won't exert influence. Because again, you have only two options in these moments, and I'll tell you in a moment what they are. But that moment matters a lot. Now let's go to a different category of outcome. How many of you think it's possible that how this scenario plays out could affect, let's say, patient safety? Do you think it could? Yeah. Yeah, now you're raising your hand uh, is supportive of the fact that you get the, the dynamics here. So whether she gets shut down here will affect whether she speaks up at a later moment about other issues. Is that right? Yeah. And that affects whether others speak up. So we start developing a culture of silence where people don't bring up potential risks to patients or, or problems that, that might affect, uh, uh, effectively compromise safety. So it affects that. How many of you think this could affect, oh, let's say, uh, uh, physician satisfaction. Do you think it could? Yeah, now, we're not as quick to raise our hands there, but if you start playing it out, you'll recognize that whether or not she feels engaged affects the support he gets and inevitably affects his experience of the hospital and his ability to treat the patient. And so all these things start to tie in. Nursing turnover, trust in the team, physician engagement, physician satisfaction, the quality of the patient experience, patient safety. Every one of those variables hangs on this moment. So back to the thesis again. If there's one thing that will affect every variable you care about in your life, it's going to be how you handle these moments of emotional and political risk. It turns out that's true in organizations as well. So our, our study has been to find those kinds of moments. Now, I, I, one other illustration I got a few years ago in London. I was uh, sitting next to this woman. Uh, we both finished addressing a group. Does anybody recognize her? Recognize her? Okay. No? How about her? Anyone recognize her? Who's that? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, who, who is it? Sorry, a little louder? M. M. Yes, very good. Yeah, for this group, M. <laughs> yeah, in fact, she played her in the movie James Bond, the James Bond movies. So she played M, uh, who was patterned after Dame Stella Remington, who was the first female head of MI5, the domestic spy agency in the UK. Uh, so. She was uh, the head of MI5 for many years, a spy agency, and was speaking to this group about leadership and what she learned, and particularly as a woman leading this kind of an organization. Very, very insightful. But after I'd finished my remarks, the two of us were sitting down at lunch, and she said, you know, I had some of those kinds of moments in my career. And I perked up. I said, well, tell me about some. She said, well, I, I remember one with, with some degree of, uh, of concern that happened. She said there'd been a bombing the day before, uh, an IRA bombing. So she said, as was the custom, I had a briefing the next morning with the Prime Minister, who at the time was Lady Thatcher. She said, and this is a little controversial, I'm not taking a side on it, but she said, this was during Lady Thatcher's mad phase. Now you can decide if she had a mad phase or not, but at least according to Dame Stella, there was this period of, uh, of somewhat emotional and mental instability. So this is during her mad phase. She says, so I was waiting in her office for her to arrive. She was about 20 minutes late. Finally, she walks into the room. She said, she comes up to my chair, stands up over me for a moment, straightens her outfit, sits down, and then looks at a spot up over my right shoulder. Didn't make eye contact with me. And without greeting me, Lady Thatcher says, so what about this business with the bombing? Dame Stella said, as soon as I opened my mouth to begin the security briefing, Lady Thatcher cut me off and began to brief me. She said she went on for about 10 minutes telling what happened and her belief about policy responses and potential threats and risks in the future and got significant points wrong. 
She said, after the 10 minute monologue, Lady Thatcher stood up, straightened her skirt, pivoted and started to walk out of the room without once asking the head of the domestic spy agency for a security briefing. Now, what would you want the head of the spy agency to do under these circumstances? What would you hope she would do? Yeah, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you hope she'd say, wait a minute, you know, you're missing a couple of pieces of information. Wouldn't you hope that would happen? Now, let me ask you a corollary question. How many of you think it's possible that important foreign policy decisions occasionally get made based on bad information? Do you think that could happen? <laughs> and if so, the question that we need to ask is, what's the human process that allows that to occur? If we have well-trained, smart people on our payroll, and we generally do in these agencies, what allows them to collectively respond in such a colossally bad way that you can end up with a horrible foreign policy decision made? Well, it turns out this is it. That's the moment. So I asked Lady uh, Dame Stella, I said, what did you do? She said, I let her walk out. She said, I didn't say anything. She said, after all, she had made up her mind. So the problem is not Lady Thatcher here. The problem is Dame Stella. The problem is this is one of those moments of acute emotional and political risk, and she wasn't prepared for it. She didn't know how to step into that breach and affect influence in a positive way. And it turns out this is wider spread than, than we might think. It's not just about heads of state, and it's not just about hospitals. It turns out it happens in malls. Could you believe that? So a number of years ago, uh, my son had a science fair project he had to do, and, uh, and he asked me uh, for an idea. And so I suggested a couple of things. He said, no, nah, I'm thinking about something more kind of in the social science domain. I said, really? I said, what do you want to do? I said, he said, I want to put little kids in circumstances where they have to say something really uncomfortable and see how they respond. <laughs> and I said, sounds interesting. And I, I said, uh, so, so what are you thinking? He sort of described it. And at first, I, I discouraged him a bit. I said, I don't know, because little kids often don't have the same sort of social constraints that adults do. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I know what I want to do. And so he designed the experiment. Here's what he found. We all know adults stink at talking about tough things. But how about little kids? Here's my experiment. Feed kids wretched brownies, then see if they'll tell you the truth, especially when they think it might hurt your feelings. First, I made the brownies. Lots of chocolate, eggs and flour, but instead of sugar, I put in salt. Lots of salt. There's no way they could like these better. Now I recruit kids of various ages for a taste test. I tell them I want to compare ordinary brownies to my special brownies. My dear grandmother's special recipe. My dear dead grandmother's special recipe. Then I give them a dollar for being such a big help. My parents always taught me that if you want someone to like you, give them money. Okay, here goes. First they ate the yummy sugar brownies. Next, they eat the salt bricks. Watch this girl. She can hardly keep from gagging. And now for the crucial moment. Will they tell me the truth and possibly offend me? I asked them to point to the brownies they like best. No surprise that some tried to spare my feelings. But watch. Even the one who gagged? And how about really little kids? But do you want to know what they really thought? Here, guys, I have leftovers. Does anybody want seconds? Isn't that staggering? I mean, now, now you're watching it not knowing a lot of these people, but, you know, Brother Anthony and Jake Hills know some of these people. You know, where do you get subjects for science fair projects? They're our neighbors, right? These are kids from the neighborhood. That little girl whose face was puckering up, her name is Hannah Davies. She lived right next door to us. She is one of the most blunt, honest, outspoken kids in the entire world. Is that right, Brother Anthony? 
Yeah. She, she, she doesn't spare fools, right? And she's lying about the brownies. I mean, it was absolutely mind-blowing. And we started to realize through this and a lot of other research and experiences, we started to realize at what a remarkably young age you and I start to draw a horrific conclusion. You and I start to carry a belief in our minds that affects how we show up in these moments of disproportionate influence for the rest of our lives. The conclusion we begin to draw is you frequently have to choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend. That's what you and I start to think. And that belief causes mischief in every relationship, every organizational circumstance that you will inhabit for the rest of your life. Because we start thinking you got to pick. Okay, do I tell the truth? Eh, I don't think so because they're going to get mad and they're not going to be able to deal with it. And, and so we, we sugarcoat the truth. And that starts to show up in every relationship. So here's the big idea. The principle I want to share is that there are these kinds of moments. There are moments when these conditions kind of come together. These are high stakes issues, things that are really important to us. These are times when we think other people are going to disagree with us. These are times when, when we have really strong opinions about the topic as well. And these moments will happen all the time. The irony is that when those moments occur, these moments of acute emotional and political risk, when it matters most, you and I do our absolute worst. We stick our heads in the sand. We withdraw. We pull away. And it's not just us in this room. This is the common sort of human response to it. We, we either sort of avoid it or we sugarcoat the truth. We don't tell the truth. I, I was once talking with a high counselor in our state. This was many years ago. And I said, so how's the high council experience going? And he said, oh, oh man, he goes, the meetings we have on Tuesday night are just interminable. He goes, they'll go on for hours and hours and hours. He said, we got this person who will make these long speeches and it's off topic and then somebody else who also needs to weigh in, it just goes forever. And I said, well, well, you know, why don't, why don't you give some feedback to the group or something? Why don't you do that? And he, he literally recoiled. He kind of pulled back and went into a fetal position, you know, sort of <laughs> rocking back and forth almost. And, and I said, so what, what are they going to do, fire you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and how bad would it be really, you know, if, <laughs> if they didn't? And the, the model, and I know we're talking to a, a primarily LDS audience here, but I, so I want to draw on that. The, the model for Christian discipleness is not one that compromises truth. The, the model of discipleship and apostleship and engagement in the church community that you read when you look at the New Testament and you look at the Doctrine and Covenants is one of robust candor and honesty. It's also one of obedience, but it's not obedience prior to being honest and open and speaking our minds. And, and somehow we don't capture that. We don't learn that. We learn the opposite of what the actual doctrine is in our kind of cultural practices sometimes in the church. What we found in our research is healthy organizations, healthy families, healthy wards, healthy elders and quorums and relief societies. Healthy organizations are built on that last principle, finding a way. Now, now how do you do this? This will be your life's work to learn. And we've learned some things and we write about it and we share it, but it ought to be your life's work to say, how can I find a way? How can I develop the capacity to speak the truth in love? How do you do that? How do you find a way to not choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend? Because you know what? Your relationship with the Savior or with the Spirit is one where you get absolute truth delivered to you all the time and you're okay with it. You're all right with it. And we ought to be able to learn the, to, to do the same as well. That's what makes an organization work. I one time, uh, years ago, was assigned to home teach a family where they were about to go through a, a, a divorce. and. Uh, and I got some information prior to a visit one evening that the, the mother in the family was committing adultery. Now, I didn't know this for sure, but it seemed pretty possible, pretty likely that that was going on. And so here I am sitting with this, and I'm about to go in and talk with this family. Now, I don't know that this is a topic I'd necessarily bring up with all the kids present, but, but as that sat in me and I thought, so what do you do as a home teacher? Do you fake it? Do you fake it? Do you pretend, pretend like you don't think this? Do you carry this around in your head? Here are your choices. When it comes to these moments, you have two and only two options. One is to talk it out. One is to say, is there a way I could express this, this, this that shows love and respect and care and concern, but also is absolutely truthful? To really lay it out. 
Is it possible to do that? If you don't do number one, if you don't talk it out, you will do the second option. You don't get to vote on it. If you don't talk it out, you act it out. It shows up in your behavior. It divides the relationship. It causes you to disengage. And I thought, you know what? I've been asked to be part of this family's life. My job is to minister, and I can't do that living a lie. I have to find a way to be honest and open and candid. Now, how do you do that? That's a life challenge to learn. But my message to you is you won't accomplish your life's work without this skill set. It's something you have to studiously explore, and you'll blow it a lot. You'll make mistakes. You'll bring something up in a clumsy way, and it'll blow up in your face. And you know what? The answer is not to go back to that sucker's choice of choosing between telling the truth and keeping a friend. It's to go back to the fundamental engineering problem of how do you do both? How can you load both into the conversation and have it still sustain the weight of them? How do you accomplish that? That's the fundamental challenge. Now, the, the first big idea I wanted to share then is that what you ought to be monitoring in your life is the number of these emotionally and politically risky moments that you're not dealing with as well as you can. And don't beat yourself up, but just study it. Think about it. Acquire knowledge. Watch people who are really good with it. You'll have mentors in your life, and you'll say, wow, how do they do that? Well, don't stop with admiration. You know, what you ought to do is start working on emulation. Start watching them and saying, how do they start? And then how do they raise the issue? And how do they conclude? So let's play with it for a moment. I want to have you watch more of a, a project management situation. So you're going to watch a senior management manager here on the left. And on the right is a project manager. So person A, person B. Who was person A before? OK, so person A was Nurse Bonnie. This time you're going to be Bruce, the guy on the left. OK? Uh, <laughs> you're really happy about that. Good. OK, person B, raise your hand. Person B. Okay, your name is uh, Yolanda, you're the woman on the right, okay? So here's what's going to happen. I want you to watch how this plays out, and then once again, those of you who are Yolanda, who are person B, I want you to just say the next sentence you would say if you were her. So just take a shot at it. You know, you're not going to get graded on this, but, but just how would you find a way to, to deal with this moment? Okay, here you go. Okay, good. So if, if you haven't been in that meeting yet, let me, let me promise you, you're going to be in that meeting. Um, that's going to happen. Um, is that right, Brother Warnick? <laughs> um, so you're, you're on your way there. The question is, how will you show up in that moment? So, so how many of you think that if that is how project deadlines and resource negotiations happen, that it could affect project outcomes? Do you think that could happen? Yeah, it turns out that these are the predictors. So what, what happens that predicts the success or failure of a project is sometimes technical. But more often than not, it's not technical. It's human. There was knowledge and information and perspective in the human system, but it didn't bubble up. It didn't get advocated. It didn't get asserted. And so it wasn't made part of the decision-making process. Uh, our studies show that 90% of people today that are working on high-stakes projects, 90% of people today report that they see profound risks that they don't talk about. 90%. I mean, that's the disease in our human systems. And it doesn't get solved by us being smarter on the technical side. It gets smarter or it gets better by us being more skillful at dealing with that precise kind of moment. So the question becomes, how do you do this? I mean, how, how would you manage this moment? How, how would you speak up just then? So let me, uh, let me take you past it for a second. I want you now to watch. I, I watched that actual conversation take place. So these were actors reenacting it. But as part of our research, we actually saw that kind of thing go down. But we were watching the Yolanda character because she was particularly skillful at handling these moments. And we wanted to see how does she do it. We wanted to do actual field observation. So I want you to watch what she does and take notes, and figure out why it works. How does she find a way to both tell the truth and keep a friend? You know, how does she transcend that, that false dichotomy? Here you go. Okay, now, first question. If you were watching that, sitting in a meeting where that person dealt with it that way, how many of you would give her high marks for guts? How many would say that that's, I mean, she put it out there, right? She's dealing with the issue. How many of you think there's at least a chance, we don't know for sure, how many of you think there's at least a chance that that relationship could still be intact afterwards? How many of you would give it some possibility? Yeah. Now, I can tell you not only about the possibility, but about the outcome. Not only was the relationship intact, it was stronger than it otherwise would have been. If she hadn't talked that out, what would she have done? She would have acted it out. It would have affected her behavior. 
She would have been passive aggressive. She would have been resentful. She would have disengaged. She would have undermined it. It would have damaged trust in the team. All of that would have happened. But instead, she managed to respectfully deal with the issue. It was a powerful moment. Now, the other thing I'll tell you is he never did that to her again. He did it to other people in the organization. <laughs> but he never did it to her. Now, that's an important distinction because your job is to hold boundaries for you. And if you don't, then people push them in. And you have no influence in your organization. And the reason people sometimes violate processes, violate protocols, violate trust is because they aren't held accountable. The question is, can you do it? Even with people that are more powerful than you, can you do it? And the truth is, it's possible. It's possible. Now, if you took notes, I hope you at least captured this one thing. I want you to listen to her. I'm going to play just the first part of her response one more time. And I want you, if you can, to raise your hand the instant you hear the first emotionally important word she says. She says a word fairly early on in this intervention that is profoundly important as you're trying to learn to both tell the truth and keep a friend. See if you can spot it. Now raise your hand if you hear it. Good, good. Wait, what was the word? We. Yeah. Yeah, did you feel it? What else could she have said? I can see you're in a tough... Would that have been different? Oh, it'd been hugely different. She says, I can see we're in a tough spot here. We've made a commitment to management. Is that important? Yeah, what we found is that there are two things you have to do at the beginning of a crucial conversation. And if you learn to do them well, there are a whole variety of skills you use to do these, but you have to learn them. We know that if in the first 30 seconds of a crucial conversation you create these two conditions, what we call safety, these are two components of safety. If you can create those two, two circumstances in somebody's mind, they'll relax and they'll listen to you, even if they don't like what you're saying, even if they disagree, even if it threatens their position. Your two tasks at the beginning of the crucial conversation are number one, to help that person know you care about their problem. I can see we're in a tough spot here. We've got a commitment to management. And you know what? I don't want to disappoint the customer or management any more than you do. I really don't, Scott. I don't. That expression created that first half. You know what? We're together here. I care about our shared goals. As soon as you do that, people start opening up to what you're going to say. If they don't believe you care about their interests, they'll shut you down. And if they're more powerful than you, they'll use their authority to shut you down. And that'll happen to you time and again. And you'll walk out thinking, oh, they just couldn't handle the truth. No, 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 no. They could handle the truth. They just didn't feel safe hearing the truth. And that's your job, is to help them feel safe by creating this condition that we call mutual purpose. Second is mutual respect. This one suggests not just that I care about your problems, but that I respect you. Even if you've behaved irresponsibly or unethically, which he did. He violated the process. He set her up. That was unethical. That was dishonest. That was manipulative. And yet somehow she communicates respect to him and says, you know what? You're a flawed human being and I can treat you as a human being. I can do that. When you create those two conditions, people can hear the truth from you. That's what it means to speak the truth in love. And that's what we have to master the capacity to do. Here's what we know. You and I tend to believe there are some topics that are just not discussable. I can't say this to my husband or my wife or to my neighbor or to my elders corn president. I just couldn't say this. You can't say that. It turns out that's just not true. If you can create enough safety, you can talk with almost anyone about almost anything. And that's what we need to learn to more consciously and intentionally do. So, second big idea in conclusion is this. That if you learn to recognize that you're in a crucial conversation and the limiting factor to your capacity to speak honestly is not the riskiness of the topic, but the amount of safety you know how to create, what you've got to learn to do is when you recognize that deficit, set aside the issue for just a moment and restore some safety. Then go back to honestly sharing your point of view. Tell them the brownies are hot, awful. You know? tell, tell them they're horrible. And you can say that. They may not like it. It may not feel great, but they'll be able to hear it. And that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's what strengthens relationships. That's what increases your influence. And that's what will help you to accomplish what you're capable of in your lives. Uh, I'm grateful for this chance to share some of uh, that perspective with you. I think we have a few minutes for question, uh, but I thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Got about 
three or four minutes. So if there are any questions, be happy to entertain them. Please, way in the back. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, do you want to role play it now? <laughs> um, it, it, um, I'll tell you, one of the greatest struggles that I have in moments like this happens prior to the conversation. So people will often come to you and will say, oh, I need to tell you this because I know you're so-and-so's home teacher or whatever, but don't tell them I told you, right? You ever had that happen? Which essentially means, I want to plant this information in your brain, but you have to pretend like it's not there. And so the first boundary that I've learned to create is the boundary when that information gets into my brain. As soon as somebody starts saying, I got to tell you something, but don't, I stop them. And I say, you tell me that and you're responsible for having told me that. I want to know it if it affects her welfare, but I also need the latitude to be able to share this with her. And you know what? She may guess that you're the one that told me. I don't have to tell her you're the one that told me, but she may guess. And if you're not willing to take that risk, please don't put that information in my brain because I can't go anywhere with it. Does that make sense? So I had done that. And there was risk associated with it. But first of all, it has to be private. She won't feel safe if it's not private. Second, you got to give her time to emotionally prepare. So I told her in advance, this is a conversation that might be really difficult for you to hear, and I can't not have it with you and be your friend. Um, so I framed it that way. This is about friendship. This is about loyalty. And I need to be able to talk with you about this. People get that from you. They understand the motivation. They feel a mutual purpose in that. And then next is laying out the facts, saying, I was told thus, 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 and thus. There were these pictures. There was this on your Facebook. There was this over here. And that's the information that I've got. And when I add that up in my head, here's how it looks. I don't know that that's true. So the fourth piece of it is you share it tentatively. You, you start by creating safety with privacy and with asking for permission. Secondly, you lay out the facts without judgments and without your attributions. And third, you do it tentatively. I didn't tell her I know that you're doing this, but I said it kind of looks like this might be a challenge. And you know what? If that's going on and you want help, I want to help. I want to help. And I won't tell you her answer, but, uh, but that was the, the process. But it begins with making sure you have the freedom to use the facts that you're going to have to use. Good. There was another question? Please, not another one about adultery. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. She says, sometimes it's tough to give feedback in the moment because people might be emotionally aroused and so it's difficult for them to hear. That's absolutely the case. So, so the um, uh, emotional arousal is chemical, not just electrical. It's not just something that happens in the brain. It's something that's happening in the chemistry. And so it's appropriate when you're trying to create safety to also let those wash out of the system a little bit. Um, what I found is important, though, it's easy in the moment to think, oh, I ought to speak up about this, but I'm going to choose not to right now and then you chicken out later. You ever done that? And so it's important to put a bookmark in it. Uh, what I find is important to do is to make a conscious commitment within them to say, I've, I've got a few concerns about what's going on. I'd like to talk about it later. Now is probably not the right time. But that commits me so that I'm not going to leave myself off the hook later. Yeah, good. We done? All right, thank you very much.